You know, the Bible says many are the plans in a man's heart, but only the Lord directs the course. Yeah. yeah? I want you to think right now about your biggest disappointment in life. You got it? Are you thinking about it? Thinking about the biggest disappointment in your life. And here's what the Word of God says. Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. I'm sorry, I have it memorized, so I'm not even reading this. I'll read it the right way. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil. Not welfare like food stamps, but good. <laughs> Prosperity. And not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And you see in this play, it's like, you know, people have all these dreams and all these, these ideas of how their life is going to go. You know, the, the plans that we have, that we come up with. Oh, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be this and that. And then life hits. Things don't turn out the way that you plan. And it's so easy for us to feel like we have failed, to feel like, like life hasn't worked out for us. Things have turned against us. The things are too painful. But the Lord says over and over and over in his word that he has come to be our redeemer. And what redeemer means, it's redimere, it's a, it's a Latin word, and it means to buy something back. And I just have this, this picture of, like, at a, at a slave auction, you know that we're slaves to sin. And Jesus comes and says, I want that one. But not to harm and not to devastate and not to crush, but to buy back so that he can bless and bless us. And so today, I just think this, this play, can we just thank these kids again? They worked so hard. But I think that's, you know, that's the message that so, so many people struggle with, is that they've blown it too much, that they've gone too far, that there's no coming back from whatever it is, or that the circumstances that they're in are, are just destined to be terrible. And, and the word of God says just the opposite, that God is a God of hope. And it says that hope does not disappoint us. And it says that he does know the plans he has for us, plans to prosper us. And we have an enemy of our souls that wants to tell us that that's for everyone else except for you. So what is the purpose? In Isaiah 43, it says, But now says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. And you know, I always think about the word redeem. Like when you go to redeem a coupon, you know, you bring in your coupon, and then they give you something back of value. And that was what Jesus did when he went to the cross, is that he bought us back. It's like he said, he said, I know they have sinned. I know, I know that Jody has sinned, but I'm going to pay the price. I'm going to, I'm going to redeem her. I'm going to buy her back. And that's what he did for all of us. And even in the midst of the darkest trials or the most hopeless situations, his promise is to prosper us and not to harm us. You know, God will allow us to go things not to break us, but to make us more and more like him. Um, it says in Psalm 119.71, it says, My suffering was good for me, for it taught me to pay attention to your decrees. You know, um, before I came to know the Lord, I had a near-death experience. I was in Norway, and I was laying on my deathbed. And I had all kinds of plans. I was going to get my doctorate, and I was going to do all of these things, these, these really significant things that I thought were so important. But then I got meningitis, and I almost died. And what it did was it 
it turned my heart toward the Lord and it started, it started to draw me back to the Lord and started to show me what I was really created to do, what, I, what the purpose for my life really was. And um, C.S. Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And the one thing that always gives me hope when I'm going through a hard time, and, and, and if you're going through a hard time right now, I just want to encourage you that it's a season. I, I love the concept of seasons. You know, you think about when you, when you look at the, the normal calendar in a place like Utah, okay, because we actually have, I guess we have like 15 or 16 seasons, right? <laughs> we have winter, spring, winter, spring, winter, spring, summer, <laughs> but... You know, it's like when we go through a hard time, I always think, you know, this too shall pass. You know, we go through seasons. We have winter, which is a season of just barrenness. And then we have spring, which is a season of planting and tilling and, and working the land. And then we have summer, which is a season of waiting. That's always a hard one, isn't it? Waiting. You know, one of the, one of the biggest trials for me right now is, you know, just even this building or our location or where are we going to go and, and crying out to the Lord and just saying, Lord, speak something. I'm going to talk a lot more about it next week. But, but you know, the, the thing is, it's like when you're in the middle of that season of just waiting, waiting for whatever it is, waiting for something, waiting for healing or waiting for um, a relationship to resolve itself or waiting to find your spouse or waiting for your spouse to change or waiting, you know, all those things that we wait for. And the good thing is there's harvest. The fall is a season of harvest. But if you think about it realistically, that's only about 25% of the time. So the majority of the time in life, we are going to go through trials. We are going to go through hardships. You know, like the story portrayed, there are hardships, there are difficult things that people live with and through. But God is a God of hope, and he wants to redeem our lives. That's the thing that makes me so hopeful about moving on and knowing that nothing slips through his fingers. You know, I, I, I didn't think that I was going to be a widow at my age. I never thought that was never my plan. But, you know, there is a bittersweetness that has come through knowing that God is completely sovereign and he is completely in control of everything, including my life and the life of this church. And I just want to offer you that hope. If you're going through something really difficult and really painful right now, God is your only source of comfort. Don't get mad at him. Don't reject him. Draw near to the Lord. So what is the prospect Knowing that our God is a God of love, knowing that our God is a God who has said that he wants to redeem our lives. Titus 2.14 says, he, Jesus, gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. So the four things I see in this passage, he came to free us. He came to set us free from sin. Past, present, future. You know, when Jesus went to the cross, how many of your sins were in the future? Every single one. And when Jesus went to the cross, he knew every single sin that each one of us would commit. And yet, he said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He came to set us free from those things, and he came to cleanse us. He came to cleanse us from our selfishness. And from the error of our ways, he came to cleanse us from those sins. And he came to adopt us, to make us his own, to call us by name. Like it says in Isaiah, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. And he came to empower us. He came to make us zealous. He came to fill us with his Holy Spirit. Today's Pentecost Sunday. If you want to read about what happened, Acts chapter 2 says they were sent to a room to wait and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and we still have that power today available to us all you have to do is ask you ask the Lord fill me with your Holy Spirit 
fill me with your Holy Spirit. And I have some crazy stories about some crazy things that happen to people when they ask the Lord to fill them with their Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit. My uh, pastor got filled with the Holy Spirit sitting on the toilet. So, you know, God is not bound. I mean, it doesn't just happen in church or it doesn't. I mean, God can do whatever God's going to do. But ask him, just say, fill me, Lord. Fill me today. Fill me and give me what I need today. Empower me to do what honors you and what pleases you. You know, um, there's a story about a guy named uh, Harry Morehouse. How many of you have ever, have you ever heard of Moody Bible Church? Um, Moody Bible Church is a, is a really, really old church in Chicago, and the pastor there now is Erwin Lutzer. And he told the story about um, when D.L. Moody was the pastor. Um, and a young guy named Harry Morehouse begged him to come and speak. And D.L. Moody is kind of like, oh, this guy's too young. He doesn't even have, he doesn't even need to shave yet. You know, what does this guy have to offer our church? And so finally through a a series of circumstances, Harry Morehouse ended up coming there. And he preached on John 3.16. So all of the mature Christians, we close up now. We're like, oh, yeah, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? He preached for seven nights on that one verse. It says, after preaching John 3.16 for six nights, the last night Morehouse went into the pulpit and every eye was on him, wondering what text he was going to teach from. And he began and he said, friends, I have been hunting all day for a new text, but I can't find one as good as the old one. So we will go back to the third chapter of John and the 16th verse. D.L. Moody said he could never forget the closing words of that night's sermon. Morehouse said, my friends, for a whole week I've been trying to tell you how much God loves you. But I can't even do it with this poor stammering tongue. If I could borrow Jacob's ladder and climb up to heaven and ask Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, to tell me how much God loves sinners, all he could say to me would be, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Moody was convinced and he changed his manner of preaching from that point on. Now he preached that God was behind every sinner with love instead of a sword. And that in rejecting God, the sinner was running away from the love of God. You guys, if you have any theology at all, you have to understand that it's because he so loved the world. That is why he sent Jesus. And I remember I had a, my great grandmother, she was three months shy of 100 when she died. And she loved Jesus. She was about this tall, and she would sit in her rocker. She was this little German woman, and she'd say, Jesus, oh, Jesus, come and take me. Oh, Jesus, why do you take the young and you let an old one come and take me? She would just rock and pray. She didn't understand. She's like, I just want to go home and be with Jesus. She didn't fear death. She yearned for it. She longed for it. Do you fear death? Or do you yearn for it? Do you know that when you die, you're going to stand and look into his glorious face? The one who went to the cross and paid the penalty for the sins of the whole world. 
Do you fear death? Or do you know that it'll transport you into that glorious place? God so loved. He so redeemed. He so loved the world that he gave his only son. And if we believe in him, we will not perish. But we'll have everlasting life. It doesn't say if we do all these things, if we clean up our act and stop whatever it is that we call sin. It says if we believe. If we believe that message that he went to the cross for you. He went to the cross so that you could be redeemed, so that he could buy you back. All he's asking is that you believe that he paid that price for you so that you could be forgiven, so that you could have eternal life starting today. That's the gospel. That's the good news. We just complicate it so much, don't we? We make it so difficult. We can just believe. It says that we will have everlasting life. We will have an abundant life. And I know there are a lot here today you're suffering. And you have a lot of questions. I know there are those of you who have cancer and other health issues. You're having financial problems. You're having relationship problems. You're having marital problems. You have bitterness from the past. You have kids who are prodigals. You have relationship issues. You're struggling. And Jesus says that he came to redeem your life. He came to set us free, to cleanse us, to adopt us, and to empower us. That is why Jesus came. That is why he came, and that's the plan. The plan is that he would redeem your life so that you could live in the abundant life that he promised.